Heavenly Father, I do want to thank you so much for this privilege, this opportunity to come before your wonderful throne. And Lord, I pray that you be with our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are not able to join us this morning for uh, various reasons. Lord, I know that there are many who are traveling. There are many who are celebrating. There are many who are sick. And so, God, I pray that you uh, continue to speak to them, that you uh, reach out to them, Lord, that you uh, help us to be the... um, the messengers, if you will, of this good news to them on their return. And so, God, I pray that you uh, guide us this morning, uh, set aside all fear, anxiety, trepidation. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, these words that uh, come forth are not my own, but are uh, of your truth and your word. So, God, we pray all of this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. So we are continuing here in the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. If you remember, we looked at verses 1 through 17, and we're picking up here with verse 18 through 31. We're going to try and round out the chapter this morning. And I want to begin just by reading verse 18, which says, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved It is the power of God. Paul's first words of critique against the church in Corinth was a critique of division. Paul listed uh, in verse 12 there, uh, where in verse 11 he says he's heard from Chloe's people, uh, and that pe- folks are saying, verse 12, that I am of Paul, or I am of Apollo, so I am Cephas, and I am of Christ. And he boldly says in verse 13, has Christ been divided? The church in Corinth had begin, had created divisions amongst itself along lines of human wisdom, along lines of human popularity, along human lines. And so Paul's critique is that this division is unholy and unhelpful. But notice, division in and of itself is not wrong. Division in and of itself is not wrong. We defined what the church was when Paul was understanding, gave to us his understanding of the church. And we see that the church is a body of people who are called out, divided, if you will, from the world. And so we see that division isn't a bad thing. What is wrong is in the how of that division. And in the case of the church in Corinth, the division was based on cleverness of speech and human wisdom. Notice that's Paul's concern at the end of verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. Perhaps he's saying to the church in Corinth, what you have been hearing by these false teachers is clever speech, is human wisdom. I come to you not in that manner, but with the truth of the gospel. And so Paul clarifies what is rightly and necessarily a proper division. What is it that divides properly, necessarily, rightly? That division is the word of the cross. For the word of the cross, verse 18, is to those who are perishing foolishness. So there he sets it up. Those who are perishing, the word of the cross is foolishness to them. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul has drawn a division, a distinction within the church. Today, we hate using language of us versus them. And certainly when we use us versus them along human lines, we can cause things like racism. 
We can cause things uh, like ableism and, and other divisions that we can set in place when we start defining based on our own agendas or experiences. But notice Paul does not quiver at all. He does not quake. He does not stop from drawing a distinction based on the word of the cross. To the ones perishing, to them, it is folly. But to the ones being saved, and notice Paul lumps himself and the church, the recipients of this letter, into it. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul draws a right and necessary distinction between the church and the world. And this is going to be a major lesson to the church in Corinth. Because what the church in Corinth was doing was bringing in the culture, bringing in the world, bringing in the flesh, and bringing it into the church. And how did Paul define the church? Let me say it again. This is, we, we came to this conclusion last week. In verse 2, I'm roughly paraphrasing, but Paul would define the church as this. All those saints called out of the world, called out of the world, set apart for God by Jesus' atoning work and who take on Christ's likeness in the world. So notice two things here. Paul doesn't tell the church to be completely separate from the world in the sense that we are not to engage at all. No, we engage in the world. But we engage in the world as image bearers of Christ. In Christ likeness. The church engages in the world in Christ likeness. That's a good thing. But Paul's concern is when the world starts engaging in the church in sin-likeness. And at that point, if that is allowed to, to fester, or as Jesus says, allows a little leaven to, le to leaven the whole loaf, what that causes is now the church no longer is set apart from the world, but is the world. And we don't have a church. And of course, this is Paul's concern to the church in Corinth. And I would dare say it's his concern for the church in the 21st century. Notice here that this is no different from the teaching of Jesus Christ. Our Bible study, uh, which uh, ended for the, uh, the summer this past week, we looked at Matthew chapter 7. And Matthew chapter 7 is the last of uh, the last chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the last third of that chapter, Jesus talks about the fool who does what? Who builds his house where? Where does the fool build his house? On sand. On sand. And the wise man builds his house on the rock. Notice Jesus himself is drawing that distinction. The wise build their house, their life, everything on a solid foundation. The fool builds his life, his house, his everything on shifting sands. And it is this conversation on wisdom that Paul is going to highlight in the rest of of this chapter. And what we're going to come to understand, certainly here, and I would say by the end of 1 Corinthians, we're going to come to see that sound doctrine is the solid foundation, the rock, on which both Jesus and Paul tell us to build our houses. And it is false teaching, false doctrine, that the fool builds his house. And so here we get to the foolish wisdom of the world. Verses 19 through 21. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Let me repeat that because that's the key phrase there. Verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its own wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached, or quite literally in the Greek, the preaching preached to save those who believe. Here we see Paul's continuing this division, the division of a right division of the word of the cross, the division of wisdom and folly. Paul draws from the Old Testament. I want to read to you just briefly this passage here, verse 19. It's a quote from Isaiah chapter 29, verses 13 through 14. And this whole section, Isaiah 29, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but this section is about people who reject God's wisdom will have uh, their own understanding destroyed by God. Let me read these verses here, 13 and 14. Then the Lord said, again, as Isaiah 29, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be concealed. There is Paul's quote at the end of that section. Paul quoting that any good Jew, any good Christian would have recognized immediately the context, and this is that context that people who reject God's wisdom, what is God's wisdom? It's the sound doctrine presented to us in Scripture. Where do we learn wisdom? From God, from his word. Those who reject God's wisdom will have their own understanding destroyed by God himself. A la Romans 1.28 where Paul tells the church in Rome that God hands people over to a depraved mind. God will sometimes, in his passive judgment, give people over to their wisdom so that they can follow their own smarts further and further into iniquity. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. So Paul asks, in light of that reality, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Where is the scientist? Where is the politician? Where are the experts? They are falling into their wisdom more and more. God himself will render foolish the wisdom of the world because the wisdom of the world can never come to know God. How do we know God? Through his self-revelation in Scripture. This whole letter is Paul bringing the church in Corinth back to the book, back to teaching that comes from God. Now, perhaps one of you might be saying, but pastor, 
Didn't God give these people this smarts, this wisdom, this intellect, this knowledge, this know-how? Didn't God give them that? Yes, he did. But when we use it, not for his glory, it is used in vain glory. When people who have been gifted the wisdom that they have, the smarts that they have, the brilliance that they have, because we know some pretty smart people. We can just think of some pretty brilliant folks. And if they are not using their wisdom, their brilliance, their smarts for the glory of God, then they are using it for vain glory. And that, my friends, has no room in heaven. We hear these talking heads, these so-called experts on our favorite news station, MSNBC, Fox, CNN, whatever. We listen to these folks hours upon hours. We have their talking in the background of our minds. These so-called experts who speak with cleverness of speech who speak with human wisdom, but they all speak lies. Worldly wisdom, no matter how brilliant it may be, no matter how talented that person may be, worldly wisdom can never know or discover God without first the foolishness of the word. Because there are some pretty brilliant folks out there who are faithful to God. And they use their smarts, their brilliance, their talents for the glory of God. Why? Because they sit under sound teaching. They read sound doctrine. They have, as Paul says to the church in Rome, have been renewed, have had their minds renewed and transformed by this foolishness that we call preaching. There are many in this community who would probably call me a fool for doing what I'm doing right now. There are many in this community who would call you all fools for doing what you're doing right now. And what we're doing is listening to sound doctrine. But notice, as a word of warning, that not all preaching is wise. There are many false teachers in churches who prefer to tickle people's ears and tiptoe around issues for whatever reason. Money, power, fame, fear. There are many false teachers and elders who fear offending someone than offending God. Do you fear offending someone? Or do you fear offending God? Sound doctrine is Christ crucified. That is the soundness of this teaching, Paul says. This wisdom that is the foolishness of preaching is Jesus Christ, the word of the cross. It is his righteousness. His righteous life that he lived, perfect obedience to God. His life of submission to the Father. It is his atonement, his going to the cross as a sacrifice, his blood being shed on our behalf, the wrath of God poured out against him so it won't have to be poured out against us. And it's his redemption his giving to us, to the church, 
the mantle of his righteousness, the grace which we so love, the mercy to which we appeal. And the preaching of Christ crucified is our weakness and our submission to that truth. Because we might believe all this, but if we for one second think we know better or know more than God, then we are not submitting to the truth of the gospel. And this is Paul's concern for the church in Corinth, that the Christians there, that the folks there are not submitting to Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. And so he goes further to define the scandalous wisdom of the cross, verses 22 through 25. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those of us who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. When we preach, when we teach, when we live the Jesus of the Bible, it will confound unbelievers. And it will convict true believers. Notice the division. The gospel confounds the unbeliever. It confuses them. The gospel for the believer is clear. And it convicts. People will flock to a false Jesus. To false Jesuses that are portrayed in churches and in the media. The nationalist Jesus who loves patriotism above all else. Or the socialist Jesus who loves poverty above all else. False Jesuses, or as the New Testament calls them, antichrists. Antichrists care not for true godliness, but for self-rule and self-reliance. If the Jesus that you hear preached or the Jesus you believed says you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps, that you can do it, that you can be yourself, that you can give it your all, that you can, you can, you can, then you are listening to a false Jesus. Because the Jesus of the Bible teaches that we can't, but he does. And thanks be to God that he does. Because that, my friends, is what's called grace. Without grace, there is nothing but the blackness of sin. Without his strength, or as Paul says, God's weakness, which is still stronger than our strength. And of course, Paul is He's, being, he's speaking hyperbolically there. He's not uh, being a, a, a sacrilegious. The point he's making is that we, when, when in our human wisdom, think that we are stronger than God, that we're smarter than God, that we know better than God, God looks at us and says, your wisdom will be destroyed. Your cleverness will be wiped away. Because my wisdom, says God, my foolishness, if you will, is greater than any of our wisdoms. The Jesus of the Bible cares about what you believe and how you live in accordance to his grace and his righteousness, not our own self-righteousness. And this is what scandalizes people. It's his righteousness. This is what, I, I've mentioned this before, it's one of my favorite words in the Greek. 
In verse 23, when Paul says we preach Christ crucified and to the Jews, it is a stumbling block. That Greek word is the word scandalon. It's a scandal. The, the truth of God, the Jesus of the Bible, his righteousness scandalizes and renders fool, excuse me, foolish the world. The cross teaches us that we have nothing to offer. We cannot even bring but a penny to God and say, God, look how good I've done. Haven't I earned your love? We cannot because everything is about the cross, what Jesus brings for us. Not for himself, but for us. Why does God, uh, what's our favorite verse, I mean, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he sent who? You? Me? Joel Osteen? No. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And yet that scandalizes because the cross teaches that we have to submit to his righteousness. No one likes to submit to anything. We're Americans. We don't like our rules. If we don't like your rules, your king, what do we do? We throw them away. We rise up against him. You want to raise your taxes on our tea? Well, we'll kick it into the harbor. That's the American way. But the Christian way is to submit to the truth of Christ. And here we gain in submitting to that an understanding of true wisdom and true power. Let me round out by reading these final verses. Verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. Here in this little section, I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue, but I want to highlight here this 26 through 28. This is Paul exegeting for us what he just quoted in verse 19, where God says through Isaiah prophesies that I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. How does God do that? Verse 26, for consider your calling, church. Do you want to know how God sets aside the cleverness of the clever and how God destroys the wisdom of the wise? It's through the church. That scandalous, radical, crazy group of people who submit to this man, Jesus, and his righteousness rather than pulling up their own bootstraps and doing it themselves. For God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Verse 29, that no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. Only in submitting to Christ's righteousness are we enabled and empowered to live the life that God has deemed as truly wise and truly powerful. It's oxymoronic, isn't it? Our way of thinking is if we want it, go out there and do it yourself. I certainly have that logic when it comes to doing things at home or around the church or, or doing things. You know, very often I, I, I always keep my mouth shut 
about projects or things. Uh, because I know that if I mention it, I'll use this example. That light bulb right up above me is blown out. Now, if I had mentioned it, that means now it's my responsibility to get it fixed. We can think of examples of at home or at work. If you're around that boss who you know that if you mention anything as a critique, he's going to tell you to go fix it. He's going to put it on your plate. And so we remain quiet because that's our logic. That we think we can do it or we have to do it ourselves. But the teaching of the Bible is contradictory to that. It's an oxymoron because we can't do it unless and until we submit to his righteousness. Only through that are we enabled and empowered. And so the foolish and the weak of the world, which are those who submit to another man's righteousness, that man is, of course, Christ, So the foolish and the weak in the eyes of the world, those of us who submit ourselves to Christ and his righteousness, they shame the strong of the world. True wisdom then is shown to us in the cross so that no man may boast. Isn't that our problem? We like patting ourselves on the back. We like hearing the boss, oh, good job. You're doing great. One of the five love languages, I think, is words of affirmation. We love that. We love being affirmed. I'm not saying don't affirm people, but that's our, that's one of our big motivations. We want to see the, we want to see the reward. We want to see that, that, that sense of pride that wells up within us. And yet, the way of the cross teaches we must not boast in ourselves, but in God. Because the moment that any of us, myself included, the moment that any of us think that we got it, that we can do it, that we know all the answers, The moment we think that, we begin to boast in ourselves. But we must boast only in Christ. Or as Paul reminds them again from the Old Testament, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I just want to highlight here in closing the power of Christ there in verse 30. But by his doing, first of all, who's doing it? Is it Paul? Is it Apollos? Is it Cephas? Is it Pastor Ed? Is it Joel Osteen? But by his doing, in my Bible I have a capital H there, that is God. But by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. But Paul, Don't I have to come to Jesus? Don't I have to open the door? Don't I have to? By him, by his sovereign work and his sovereign grace, you are in Christ Jesus. And by that same grace, you, or that Christ Jesus, excuse me, is becoming to us the wisdom from God. That man who teaches things that confounds us in the Gospels, that man who tells us to live a life that is his righteousness, that submits to his truth, that man is becoming for us the wisdom from God. So we learn about who God is and who we are through Christ Jesus. Not only that, He's coming for us, the wisdom from God. There's four things, and that's what I'm going to close on. Third one, second one is this. He is also becoming for us the righteousness. It's not our righteousness that we can bring to the table. 
It is his righteousness that covers us. And so when God looks at us and sees us on that great and terrible day of judgment, when he looks at every true believer, he will not see Joe or Jack or Helen. What he sees is Christ, his son, covering that person. Because it is Jesus who is our righteousness. But it's not just righteousness. The third one here is Jesus is also becoming for us our sanctification. Paul lists in the book of Romans the golden chain. And the golden chain ends with glorification. Now that glorification is a predestination, calling, uh, uh, and then there's uh, electing and glorif- sanctification and glorification. That glorification chain, that link, is part of that chain. It's not hanging out over here and then the other four are doing their own thing and then glorification. No, it's all one chain. And so when we think about this, again, one of the other things is we can't come before God and say, God, justify us. We also can't come before God and say, look how holy I am. Look how righteous I am. Look how much I've been sanctifying my life. Well, it's not us who does it. It is Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, we are sanctified every day, growing more and more in faith. Why? Because it is the Spirit that now lives within us. No longer are we listening to that that spirit of the flesh, if you will, No longer are we slaves of unrighteousness, but now we are slaves of righteousness, of God, of the truth. And so our will is given anew through the Holy Spirit. So that's how God, Jesus, is also our sanctification. And lastly, of course, he is our redemption. Jesus redeems us. He purchases us. That's, that, that's, that's what that Greek word means. It's, it's economics terms. He redeems us. Like you go and redeem a voucher somewhere or you go redeem your coupon at Food Lion. That's what Jesus does. He redeems us before God. It is him who makes our account right before God. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts. We are indebted to God by our sin. And it is only through Christ that our debt is paid. And so let me close with this word of prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to submit to the truth of Jesus Christ, that he is for us all wisdom, all righteousness, all sanctification, and all redemption. Indeed, Jesus is our all in all. Without him, we would have nothing. And without him, whatever we think we have is but filth and trash. Because he is our all in all. He is our strength. In him, we can do all things. Not through our own power or our own wisdom, but by submitting, which is hard for us to do, God. It's hard for us to submit. We like to make our own rules or play by our own games. But we are called to submit to the gospel of truth. And so my prayer this morning is that you help us to come in reverence, humility, and submission to the Christ of the Bible. Amen and amen.